aujourd'hui qui est centré sur les jeunes, mais surtout sur comment les jeunes peuvent être des acteurs de développement euh, euh, en, étant, en mettant en œuvre une citoyenneté euh, active, en luttant contre euh, les, les, les inégalités, les, les exclusions, mais surtout euh, en cherchant des voies et moyens pour sortir des, 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 des cercles de violence qui, comme on le sait, sapent vraiment euh, le progrès économique et social. Je pense que cette thématique est, est vraiment d'une importance capitale, euh, non seulement pour le CRDI, mais pour, pour nous euh, en Afrique de façon générale. Et euh, c'est dans cette perspective que euh, nous attendons avec beaucoup d'attention euh, les présentations des panélistes qui ont dû et qui ont investi euh, leur temps, leur énergie, leur savoir euh, dans des recherches qui ont été menées depuis euh, quelques années maintenant, depuis 2017, si je ne me trompe, 2018, euh, en, Amérique, euh, en Afrique, euh, en Amérique latine, en Asie. Mais pour aujourd'hui, on va se concentrer sur euh, le travail qui a été fait surtout en Afrique, à, euh, en Tunisie, un peu en, en, en Afrique du Nord, en Afrique de l'Est, en Afrique de l'Ouest, pour vraiment, euh, encore une fois, essayer de réfléchir quelles sont les pistes de solutions euh, qui permettent aux jeunes d'être résilients euh, et, et d'avoir de, des outils qui leur permettent, des outils de, sous forme de, de processus, euh, sous forme de, de connaissances qui leur permettent vraiment d'être des acteurs complets dans le processus, dans la construction de sociétés euh, stables, prospères, euh, dans lesquelles ils pourront s'épanouir. Donc, sans plus tarder, je vais laisser la parole au professeur Ebo, qui va nous donner un peu le, les objectifs de ce webinaire, euh, en, en espérant que les enseignements qui vont être... Euh, Um, qui, vont être, qui vont émerger de ce uh, Thank you very much, Ramata. Merci uh, beaucoup. Uh, Ramata Fetch, she's the, uh, the program officer for the Pan African Project uh, Research Initiative that was launched by the IDRC uh, in 2017 and ended uh, in 2020. Uh, titled Understanding and Addressing Youth Experiences with Violence, Exclusion and Injustice in Africa. I'm greatly tempted to start out by disagreeing mildly with uh, Ramata as to the rationale for this, uh, for this webinar, because in my view, this webinar is a, a step forward from resilience, uh, which was a overarching concept that informed the um, research, mostly national grassroots uh, research on, uh, on youth and, and which really opens up uh, some, some new vistas, which I we will probably uh, discuss with, uh, with, with the moderator. My concern was that at the time that uh, this research was launched and throughout the period, uh, of the research that uh, youth issues on the global scene were undergoing uh, a true, if you wish, at least rhetorical revolution. The, the international community suddenly discovered and started celebrating youth and the so-called demographic dividend that youth uh, represented, which was really uh, a step away from the, the previous uh, concern about youth bulge and the subversive implications of, of youth activity and their temptation to, uh, uh, to join uh, violent extremist groups uh, and so on. But it happened also that uh, this did not really much feature in the uh, research uh, per se. So we thought this was a good time to, to build on it. And to do that, we've identified uh, three uh, case studies uh, from the research. Uh, where, in fact, this transition was already uh, explicit or at the very least implicit about Tunisia, Zimbabwe, and Uganda. And here today to lead us through the undoubtedly complicated analysis that this will require is an equally talented and I dare say personally also complicated colleague uh, who is a distinguished researcher on youth in his own right. Uh, Lovely uh, Ismail, 
uh, an old friend of ours uh, who has, uh, has done a very extensive work, uh, including uh, currently chairing or leading an ALC project. Uh, ALC, of course, is the Af African um, uh, Leadership uh, Center on youth uh, protests or youth radicalism, youth activism. Um, but his appearance here today uh, for us uh, is, is really expressive of three very opportune uh, uh, events. Firstly, this is a homecoming for him because he was actually one of those people who consulted for the IDRC to set the tone and the conceptual and theoretical direction of the research that you have just uh, completed. Secondly, and even more provocatively, uh, he has uh, just published, actually not just, about the uh, middle of, I believe, 2020, published uh, this extremely important overview of youth, the relationship between youth and political violence and the evidence uh, that underpins this across the very expensive literature uh, in the field. Uh, the title of it is, Why Do Youth Participate in Violence in Africa? A Review of Evidence. Uh, this is an extremely uh, important article. I've already said, uh, uh, shared it with, with, uh, with some of you. Uh, so it, uh, it, it shows clearly that he uh, himself uh, has, uh, has the same body of interest that, uh, uh, that we, we, uh, we've been uh, working on. Unfortunately, his work came out too early to take advantage of the uh, research that you have done. Uh, so what that means is that the, uh, the room is still open for him to incorporate your research. I don't believe that, uh, Wale, that you captured the so-called resilience literature other than in person. Uh, so this for us is a, it's a very important uh, occasion for him to rejoin, rejoin this project. Um, so let me, without further ado, uh, give the floor to Wale. Uh, Wale, feel free to very briefly just uh, call up the, uh, the speakers, give them a second to introduce themselves since you did not get their bios, and then we can uh, speed on our way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, Prof is, is a quintessential wine. The older it's there, the better it tastes. Um, I've been listening to Prof for the past 21 years, and you know he, he never fades. Um, thanks to Ramata as well, and thanks to everyone. Welcome to this webinar. This is a very important <laughs> webinar. We are, we are engaged with, with a moving train. The issue of youth in Africa, in the it has dominated uh, Africa's politics, Africa's security, Africa's development, discourse and debate in the last uh, 30 to 40 years. Of course, uh, not that it's entirely new, but the trajectory is that uh, through which it has evolved in the last 30 to 40 years meant that it has become a dominant theme in the analysis and realities of Africa. Of course, Ramata and Prof have both mentioned the evolution of both in terms of academic discourse, but also in terms of policy engagement and policy focus. We see from the events of the uh, Mano River, you know, uh, instability in the Mano River re uh, Union area from the 1990s, I think the country where youth initially became an object of fear, an object of panic, where youth were seen as purveyors of insecurity in Africa. From that, it evolved into uh, conversations around resilience, knowing fully well that it's only a tiny percentage of young people actually involved. In and then as Prof mentioned, in the last, uh, since 2015, there has been policy recognition and celebration and obsession with young people as being agents of peace, which they truly are in the real sense of it. But what we are seeing in the last decade are two parallel developments. One is, the increasing transformation of youth resilience into a resource for mobilization, for collective action, for youth political activism, for youth involvement in popular mass you know, movement for social change, for 
protesting of perceived and real inequalities and injustice in their respective countries. We've seen that reality in the last uh, 15 to 20 years, starting from the Arab Spring. And we have also seen on the other side, the increasing uh, erosion of democracy, the increasing erosion of um, civic space, uh, the disappearance of you know, the public sphere across a number of African countries, the return of authoritarian, uh, you know, uh, elected authoritarian, authoritarianism on the continent. Now we are seeing the latest variant of that, which is the return of military coups as well as the return of military rule. So we've seen these two parallels taking place on the continent. And in these two parallels, what we are seeing is uh, to what extent is increasing youth activism a response to the shrinking civic space? Is there a connection between these two parallels that we are having in Africa? Or actually, there are only opportunistic you know, connections between these two parallels. Today, this webinar is meant to unpack what is it, you know, all of this, what exactly is going on? What can we learn? To want to unpack this, the way we want to unpack this is to look at what is going on, what is the nexus between these two parallels that we are talking about, what is, what is going to where, and what has happened. How are young people mobilized in self-mobilization for political activism? Where are they mobilizing? What technologies, what resources, what capacities are they using for the mobilization? What is the internal dynamics of the youth groups that are involved in this political activism? How broad based are they? To what extent do they replicate the structural inequalities, the structural violence, the exclusive politics that are prevalent in societies in many African countries. Are they reproducing these same inequalities or do they already present a new vision for transforming the inequalities that exist in their respective countries? We are also going to look at what is the implication of this youth activism for development, aspects of politics, for democratic, governance, as well as the security and stability of African countries. To do all of this, we have our uh, panelists, uh, researchers who have been part of the IDRC study. We have uh, Ben Sala from the Maghrib Economic Forum. He will speak to us about events in Tunisia. We also have Ashad Ntungo, who will speak to us about events in Uganda. And we also have Russell Wita Hatande, who will speak to us about events in Zimbabwe. In addition to these three key panelists, we, we will also be getting interventions from two other people. One is Graham Simpson, which is, who is a very wonderful person, wonderful colleague. Uh, he was the author of the uh, progress study for the UN uh, on, on, on youth uh, contribution to peace and security. We'll be having you know, interventions from him. We also have intervention from uh, Sylvia Livermore from University of California. He will be talking to us about the activism of uh, of African LGBTQ uh, uh, people, uh, uh, youth who have also been involved in political activism will also be you know, giving us intervention in that regard. So without much ado, I am going to invite uh, Ben Sala, each of the three panelists, uh, you have 10 minutes each, I'll be very brutal with the time, unfortunately, because I want us to get into the exchange, into the organic you know, uh, iteration and cross-fertilization of ideas and perspective on this issue as much as possible. So you are going to have 10 minutes. After Bethala, I'm going to call on Ashad Sintungo. Again, 10 minutes. And then uh, Rosa Wita Katsandi, another 10 minutes. And then we'll take short five minutes intervention from Grant Simpson as well as Livermore uh, Xavier afterwards. Can I invite you, Bethala, please? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to share. Um, I mean, opinions and ideas and, and findings uh, out of uh, our research. Uh, I mean, when it, our idea of, of civic engagement and our experience in Tunisia has been um, concentrated around uh, civil society after our revolution or the, uh, the Arab Spring starting in 2011. But what we want to say is that when it comes to activism and uh, civic engagement, 
there's two levels. There is the level of civil society and decision making. And there's the level of civil society and youth participation. Uh, I mean, a, a little bit of a background on civil society in Tunisia and specifically when it comes to decision making. The, uh, it's been, I mean, from 2011, uh, youth, I mean, before 2011, youth have been politically engaged in universities, but were excluded from policy development and decision making. This is um, a very important thing. We didn't have access to civil society before 2011. So starting from there, uh, civil society recorded an emergence of a group uh, of modern organizations that are distinguished uh, by a clear vision, uh, accuracy of programs, and, and this is thanks to the availability of funds and human resources. So civil society, in fact, served as a, like a shield uh, to protect the revolution at some point. And uh, in fact, actually served as a substitute uh, in the absence of the state at some point right after mass uh, of the revolution. So that role in uh, we lost you, Ben Salah. Uh -oh. Hello, Ben Salah. Yeah. Well, let's give him a moment to see if he if he recovers. This is the <laughs> danger of <laughs> connected connected conferences and workshops. Yes, um, oh, I'm sure maybe his internet. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but in in essence, I, I can talk you through to what you know part of what he's saying. He's he's talking about 2011 and the Arab Spring Revolution in in Tunisia as a pivotal moment, pivotal moment for a variety of reasons. One in terms of the role of civil society in politics. And then secondly, and most importantly, you know, the role of youth in politics. And he was making the point that before 2011, young people were engaged in politics in different ways, but not as an organic, organized, centralized, uh, forms of engagement or organization. They were engaging, you know, there were some, some element of them were part of the ruling party, you know, and the rest. But despite this engagement or involvement in politics, they were excluded from meaningful politics, from key decision-making processes. And he was making that point that 2011 was a pivotal moment in that regard. And he was talking You're about- back, uh, oh. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry. I'm summarizing your talk. Please continue, please. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so, so what I was saying is that, um, yeah, I mean, in, in Tunisia, the democratic transition was a bit hard and still being hard, um, especially with the latest events. But yeah, the civil society has, has had a big role already in, in developing uh, a democratic uh, environment uh, in Tunisia. Um, it's actually, uh, and this is interesting, but sad a little bit. Uh, civil society in Tunisia took over the parliament's role at some point. Uh, they were those who suggest uh, uh, policies, legislations, and, uh, and they were holding the government accountable more than the parliament on itself. Uh, they, I mean, the Tunisian parliament had, had its own issues, but it was fighting over ideologies more than, than actual legislations uh, that uh, uh, have a tangible change uh, to the community. On the level of civil society and youth uh, and the relationship uh, between both, um, I mean, in our research, we checked or at least defined the perception of youth through uh, holding interviews and, and focus groups with, with youth around the country uh, and their perception of civil civic engagement uh, they perceive it as a way of providing a sense of belonging uh, to the community and helping them maintain personal and professional skills. And also they, they aspire for civil, civil society uh, that, ha that like, provide 
palpable and tangible change uh, and not just focus on the bigger uh, issues and uh, uh, bigger ideas. So youth in general in Tunisia, they were craving for change. Uh, that's why we had the revolution uh, and civil society is considered as that space uh, to expand youth knowledge, develop a sense of self-accomplishment and politically also engage in their communities. However, youth did express a deception uh, in the Tunisian civil society uh, due to how organizations are perceiving youth as actually more of a, a target population and not participants in, in the decision-making process. So that's also another issue with, with the Tunisian uh, uh, civil society. And when it comes, I mean, to, to link this uh, activism and, and civic engagement with, with radicalization and violent extremism in general, the, the thing is, or the main driver uh, uh, to VE in Tunisia has been uh, loss of hope and um, more of like, mm, I would say, uh, not not fulfilling expectations uh, so basically according to our study subjects the most significant driver is the sense of injustice and loss of hope which is also defined as the contrast between uh, the high expectations that youth had after the revolution and uh, the the unresponsive the unresponsive state uh, and institutions, which drives individuals also to feel marginalized and powerless. When, I mean, Tunisians have already a history when it comes to violent extremism before the revolution. We had uh, in Afghanistan in the 80s, uh, Tunisians had a small role contributing by 500 Mujahideens. Uh, also in in Iraq, uh, they had uh, participated small in small quantities, about 5% of foreign fighters in Al-Qaeda in Iraq were Tunisians. Uh, and according, uh, and, and actually from Iraq, we had a lot of uh, connections between Tunisian who are abroad in Iraq and locals who are more of recruiters and uh, supporters to the idea of, of violent extremism or radicalization in general. So the connection between uh, that loss of hope uh, and the civic engagement or civil society in Tunisia is very important when it comes to the problem of raising expectations of youth. Uh, civil society has been very aspiring for youth and uh, unfortunately they couldn't really uh, uh, contribute to a more uh, uh, participatory and inclusive, inclusive decision-making process. When it comes to the latest news, as we had a conversation, as I had the conversation uh, with, with Professor, uh, we, we ha we're having a shift in, in, in the political scene in Tunisia, starting from July, 25th of July, that we couldn't, and most uh, uh, people couldn't decide on, on positioning themselves towards that. Civil society has been uh, uh, in that position of, the, no one could decide on his position, mostly because it's quite tricky when it comes to politics right now. And also it's just a new development that we couldn't understand uh, mostly. The thing is we're afraid that we're having a, to a totalitarian regime happening. So civil society is moving towards controlling that and, and uh, evaluating what's happening, but at the same time, the population uh, is demanding uh, such a shift in politics in Tunisia since we had 10 years of, of 
democratic system, but still a lot of corruptions, uh, marginalization and injustice. So yeah, this is a general idea. I'm, I'm, I'm more intrigued to have questions uh, from participants and from, from uh, uh, panelists to discuss furthermore the experience of Tunisia when it comes to activism and uh, uh, civic engagement. Thank you so much, uh, Ben Salah. Um, thank you for flagging events in, in Tunisia up to a recent uh, ship that you, know, you mentioned. But it's quite interesting you've, you've talked about what exactly do YouTube want, the, which is part of the key questions that under, underpin this webinar. What exactly do young people want? And I think you, you know, what is it that they want in relation to their activism? What are they demanding? And I think you answer that by talking about young people want change, they want an end to marginalization. They want the elimination of structural violence, the sources of you know, structural marginalization. Uh, they want to be included. They want inclusive politics. They want good governance. Thank you so much for that. Can I call on um, Ashat Sentogo? Do we have her online? Ashat, please. Is Ashat here with us? Um, if if we can't get hold of Asha, I, saw him, so I don't know. Yeah, can I invite Rosa Wita? If Asha comes back, she can make a, a presentation after Rosa Wita. Rosa Wita, please. Thank you uh, for the opportunity. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Um, I'm gonna share experiences um, on the work that we have been doing uh, on enhancing youth parties, youth inclusion. Uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, but just to put this, um, this um, my submission into context, we are um, currently carrying out a research with support from IDRC on strengthening constructive and active youth uh, engagement in civic processes in Zimbabwe. We've been carrying out this research um, since 2018, and uh, we've been using a mixed approach where we, we've also done some components around capacity building, advocacy, uh, knowledge uh, sharing. Um, so the experiences that I'm gonna share are around um, our experiences with uh, youth inclusion in, in, in Zimbabwe, uh, what are the challenges and in particular the campaign that we have been uh, working on for a youth quota uh, in terms of representation of youth uh, in Zimbabwe. Um, so I also agree with the previous speaker that I think um, young people are very clear in terms of what they want. And for me, when you talk of youth inclusion, it's about active uh, engagement and participation of young men and uh, women in planning and in making decisions that affect themselves and others in the, in the development of a sustainable uh, future. And I think it's also important that um, uh, when you talk of inclusion, it has to be holistic and it also needs to include uh, the diverse group of uh, young people that we do have. We have young people from all backgrounds, ethnicities, religious groups, uh, cultures, minority groups and, and genders. So I think it's important to also ensure that when you talk of uh, youth inclusion, it's as uh, inclusive as, 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 as possible. Um, then in terms of um, our experiences and also uh, the current forms of youth involvement in Zimbabwe, uh, what we have noted is that um, young people are involved when it comes to uh, policy making processes, um, civic engagement. We also have had uh, young people who are organizing themselves to push for their agenda, uh, starting from community to national level. And some of the examples in terms of um, youth um, organizing themselves. We do have youth volunteer groups. We also have um, quite a number of community-based youth organizations, uh, professional youth organizations, student bodies, uh, economic empowerment groups. Um, but I think what is also very key is also to note that um, I think we have also seen an, an, an increase in the number of young people who are now in the informal sector due to the high levels of unemployment. So you also realize that there are also young people who are also organizing themselves within the vending sector. So this also reflects the nature of the economy that we have as a, as a country. 
Um, and young people also organize themselves by being part of certain political parties, social movements, uh, young women's organizations. So these are just a few examples that I also picked in terms of how uh, forms of youth inclusion. And we've also seen young people also having dialogues with solution holders, both at local and national level to be able to push uh, for their issues. And also young people finding space in mainstream organ, uh, organizations. Of interest has also been uh, how young people are also utilizing social media uh, so that they can also engage on issues um, affecting them. So I also speak uh, on it in detail uh, briefly. Uh, so these are the, some of the forms of uh, youth uh, inclusion that we, we, we have noted uh, from our experience. But I think um, it will also be important that in as much as I've defined youth, youth uh, inclusion uh, and also the forms of um, youth inclusion or engagement, we still have a challenge uh, in Zimbabwe where young people are not being fully engaged uh, when it comes to decision making, when it comes to issues that affect their livelihoods, uh, when it comes to even sustainable development. So what we have noted is the challenge around the limited participation of young people in public policy making formulation. Um, we also noted that there are low levels of knowledge on policies. For example, when we carried out a survey, it came out that a lot of young people were not aware of the constitution. They were also not aware of the national youth policy. So that also then creates uh, a gap in then ensuring that young people are actively included or involved or engaged in issues affecting uh, their livelihoods. I also spoke earlier on around um, the challenge we have of incre increased unemployment and economic um, limited economic um, empowerment, um, which has also resulted in a lot of young people not being interested in participating in uh, development or process because they also have to spend much of their time you know, trying to make a living, uh, be it vending or running a small business so that they can be able to put food on the, food on the table. Uh, we have also even had challenges around uh, the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown uh, restrictions that have also limited access of young people to civic and governance processes because uh, we have had instances where because of prohibition of public gatherings, young people are not able to organize and mobilize uh, to uh, influence our uh, processes. Um, and I spoke of this gap where we have limited participation of young people in decision and policy making processes. Um, we also realized from our research that uh, we do have low levels of youth representation and participation when it comes to decision making bodies. Uh, in 2018, when we had our elections, we realized that only 3% of the elected um, uh, officials in the National Assembly were young people. And for young people, we are looking at those aged between 18 and 35. So it's a very small number that can then be able to influence uh, and also ensure that youth issues are addressed uh, at the end of the day. So we have this challenge of youth a limited youth participation and re, uh, representation in governance issues. So in 2019, uh, the government um, introduced um, a, a constitutional amendment, which has since now been passed into an act. Of, into an act. So among the, uh, that amendment, they were all proposing uh, a youth quota uh, to be able, for them, it was around them addressing the issue of limited youth representation. Uh, so as yet what we also then did was to also run a, a campaign um, for, you know, around this issue of the youth quota system. And I think even in the past, we have also been advocating and pushing for more youth representation in leadership position, starting from community to national level, through capacity building, engaging with political parties and leaders, um, and also doing a lot of uh, our policy um, advocacy. So this campaign, um, I think what we then managed to do uh, through our engagement and what that proposal meant was that we're going to have a court, uh, we now have a youth quota system 
that quota system is basically 10 additional seats for young people, uh, which means one which means one young person per province. We do have 10 administrative provinces in the, in the country. So once we noted that there were these developments, we did a lot of police advocacy. We also analyzed the amendment to see what will be the impact of the provisions on youth um, political participation. We also even did position papers that we submitted to parliament. Um, we also even had engagement meetings and other campaigns that we did um, on national radios, the television, and even social media. Um, so what we, we noted um, as we were doing this campaign was, uh, number one, um, the quota system that was being, or that was then passed, I think it's not enough. It doesn't really represent um, young people because in Zimbabwe, young people constitute about 67% of the population. So we felt one young person per province is, is, is not enough. And young people that we are working with were totally against that um, amendment. Uh, and we also thought, uh, thought that um, the amendment or this quota system, you know, also came into place in a political environment where there's um, a lot of adult idealism, which often at times young people are regarded as lacking ability, competence, and experience in all aspects of politics. Uh, so, you know, this perception to they say, let's have a, a certain number of young people that can be part of parliament. And we feel that this politics of exclusion then restricts youth ideas and even implementation of their ideas in, 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 in Zimbabwe. And we also feel that the, the youth quota does not directly address existing laws and practices that are limiting participation of youth um, or young women in political life. For example, uh, lack of resources, lack of space, lack of you know, open space for engagement even within political parties. Um, so unfortunately, despite the advocacy that we pushed for this youth quota, uh, system was passed. And we also even noted that it was not even clear in terms of how are the other marginalized groups of young people going to be catered for, for example, young women with, with disability and other uh, groups of, of, of young people. And the other challenge is that uh, the quota also then noted that for you to get into parliament, you have to belong uh, to a certain political party because it's a proportional representative system that they are uh, that who is going to be used starting with the 2023 elections that um, are going to uh, be done thank you thank you thank you Rusuta. um let me um ask you to pause i know you have so much to say very interesting perspective uh, we're going to come back to these questions i promise you uh, because it's one of those uh, key questions that we are going to be discussing but uh, thanks so much. She has highlighted to us uh, the kinds of or the different modes of youth political activism. And this is very interesting. Um, one would think that youth political activism is only about protests and demonstrations, is only about um, rioting, as some would call it. Uh, though I take a distance from that, young people are not rioters. Um, but she's, she's, she's giving us a broader picture about the different modes of this activism in terms of how young people, activism goes beyond protest. It's also about the channels and modes of engagement that young people are inserting themselves into policy spaces, into policy processes. And she's spoken about what, you know, the you know, ideas that have been piloted, the idea of a youth quota in parliament in Zimbabwe, as novel as it is in the context of Zimbabwe, she's also telling us about the limitations of, of this quota system. We are going to come back to that because one of the questions we are going to be exploring is uh, what has been the experience in, 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 in trying to bring young people into policy processes, into promoting youth inclusion? What has worked in that regard? What are the limitations of existing uh, you know, uh, approaches to this. Uh, but we'll keep that uh, in the cooler. We'll come back to this in the second part of, of this webinar. Uh, do we have Hashad 
Sentungo with us now. Ashad, are you with us? Ashad, are you with us? Ashad, are you with us? In the absence of Ashad, uh, could I call on um, uh, Xavier Liverman to give us his intervention, then we'll come back to Graham Simpson because I believe he's most likely going to give us a more strategic overview of things. Uh, Liverman, please. You have the floor for five minutes, please. Okay, sure. Sorry, I wasn't expecting to speak <clears throat> before uh, Graham Simpson, so I'll I'll try my best. I hope that people can hear me. Um, it's very early here in California, so I say uh, good morning. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak very briefly on this issue. Um, I wanna highlight two things that the two speakers before me have spoken about uh, with Rosawita, the conversation about inclusion. Um, and my work really talks about who exactly are we including and thinking about when we're talking about the youth. And then um, I think the conversation from um, then um, then in the Tunisian context, um, this issue of um, the way in which youth have often been constructed as a targeted population, but not a population that kind of is a part and process of decision making. So in my work, I work with LGBT youth. So I'm really interested in thinking about um, the kinds of youth that get excluded, even when we're talking about the inclusion of youth. Um, and um, in that work that I'm doing, I'm looking at two different things, one of which is the way that young people are using artists, art, art, artistry and sort of more informal um, ways of organizing and, and protests, like particularly using and engaging social media to, in, to, in, to engage protest. And, um, and I've been really interested in this protest that kind of arose out of the crises of COVID in South Africa. I think that one of the things, and, and Rosuita pointed this out as well, is that governments have been able to use the crisis of lockdowns right, to, to stifle certain kinds of political dissent. So it makes it difficult for youth to kind of gather and do uh, different kinds of activism. But um, I looked very quickly at an example of uh, young people in Cape Town um, who were members of the LGBT community who basically um, illegally occupied an Airbnb um, in order to sort of uh, force the issue of LGBT homelessness in Cape Town. And I think particularly looking at the ways in which LGBT youth have some of the highest rates of homelessness in the country. Um, and a lot of this comes out of um, high rates of high school dropout, um, high rates of unemployment. And these are all higher than even the, the youth population. So if we know in South Africa, there's something like 40 to 50% of youth, basically somewhere around there, half are unemployed. Um, amongst LGBT youth, those, those numbers are actually quite higher. And a lot of that is because of um, difficulties that students have with uh, schooling, uh, difficulties they have with their families and getting support. Sometimes they're thrown out of their homes by their family um, and so forth. And this is in a country that has a relatively liberal legal process. So um, we can think about um, what happens in countries where you know the legal processes are not so liberal. Um, so I just wanted to bring up these questions and I, I think I don't wanna over, uh, overtake my time, but I want us to think about um, you know, when we're talking about the inclusion of youth, which youth are we actually talking about that are included? Um, and to think about how um, questions of gender and sexuality, I think really add another layer of um, of I think the need for creative solutions to bring in youth to, um, to a position of decision-making rather than a, a position of being a target population. So I'll, I'll stop there and thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you so much, uh, right on time. Uh, Livermon, I uh, appreciate you for bringing the LGBTQ perspective to this. Again, uh, 
when we talk about youth and youth issues in Africa, there is a tendency to gloss over the internal differentiations you know, of young people. There is that uh, tendency to essentialize youth as a monolithic group that are not internally differentiated. And this is where the risk of certain categories of young people being left behind, even in the discourse about youth and youth participation and youth inclusion. And when we talk about youth agendas, our representative, our inclusive are also the, root, you know, the youth agendas. Some of the policy pronouncements, uh, including things that have been tried in places like Zimbabwe, in Tunisia as well, to bring young people into the policy spaces. What types of young people have been brought into those policy spaces? What, you know, our representative, our inclusive are the new policy pronouncements uh, coming out of respective uh, governments in Africa when it relates to, to young people. Again, out of panic, out of the fear of uh, street power or street politics, as we call it, in which young people have been able to, you know, trigger events that have led to the exit from power of certain authoritarian regimes on the continent. We've seen uh, the, you know, uh, the, the response in the context of COVID that many governments have now been able to use COVID as a small screen for actually limiting the scope of, or the momentum of youth activism that we've seen, you know, uh, developing over the past decade across the continent. I would pause it there. We'll come back to those cross-cutting questions. Let me uh, bring in Graham Simpson to provide his own five-minute uh, intervention on youth activism and shrinking uh, civic space on the continent. Graham, please. Um, thank you, Oluwale, and thank you all colleagues for this um, opportunity. I wasn't expecting to um, make quite as formal a contribution as this, but I'm glad of the time and must also just apologize in advance. I have another meeting and going to have to speak and leave, which seems terribly rude, but hopefully I can just provoke and then um, the conversation will continue. A, a couple of things. I mean, the first is just um, I would like to draw colleagues' attention to the fact that in some ways there has within the kind of global policy space been an increasing kind of recognition and acknowledgement of this question of the protection of civic and political space. UN Security Council Resolution 2535 is perhaps the first one ever, to my knowledge, to actually, and this is a resolution on youth peace and security, so it's through the youth lens, um, to explicitly uh, commit member states to the protection of civic and political space for young people. Um, this is very significant at a, at a policy level, but also very illustrative of the distance between these normative commitments by governments and the prevailing practice of governments on the ground. Um, uh, and we can't afford to be naive about that distance and that gap. And it's not insignificant that the the Office of the Secretary General's Envoy on Youth has also just released a report which is focused very much on the issue of protection of young people and the protection of their civic space, mindful not only of um, the extent to which the securitization of young people through the counter-terrorism agenda and the, the countering of violent extremism has largely framed young people as a target um, of, these, of these processes. Um, uh, in which young people are, uh, frankly, and this came out in the progress study on youth peace and security, are more frightened of their governments than they are of extremist and terrorist groups. Um, uh, so, you know, so this is, this is I think, really important. Uh, the, the discourse is also one in which young people are very articulate about um, uh, uh, oversimplification of what protection and inclusion entails. So wary of tokenism, wary of young people being trotted out when it's about flag waving during election times, wary of young people only being seen as members of political parties rather than occupying a whole range of other spaces in civic and political life and in the policy arenas um, because of the sort of uh, tokenism or the manipulation of young people's participation. So um, these are all kind of important warning signs about how this actually plays in practice in the African context. Um, I, I do want to just, and, and I think attention has already been drawn to the fact that not only the, the CVE and counterterrorism agenda, 
but the response to COVID-19 and the um, in the the behind the rationale of um, kind of medicalized responses, et cetera, et cetera, the shutting down of civic space, the if impact on young people um, and the consequences for legitimate and often peaceful protest and dissent has under that rubric been quite worrisome. So I think this is um, very important. I do just want to draw attention to um, the way in which we think about this, um, because young people are very articulate about their insistence on being involved in all of the policy arenas that affect their lives. And when we think about civic and political participation, it's significant. What came out very strongly in the progress study in youth, peace and security is that young people described the primary interfaces with their states, often as being in the realm of education, which was all about them, but in which they felt they had no power and no voice in terms of setting the agenda, defining the curriculum, establishing the priorities, et cetera, et cetera. And the second arena, which is really, really very relevant to this, is that young people said the primary place they meet their governments is through their being the object of criminal justice and security sector institutions, um, this, this notion of securitization of young people. And once again, the failure of a youth-centered approach to SSR, to security sector reform, is a huge gap. The limitations of a youth-driven and youth-centered approach to DDR, reintegration and disengagement, et cetera, I think is a huge and important gap all of these very central in Africa, where there is creative space, where there is amazing youth innovation and, and creativity that I think um, is not being recognized. And then lastly, just to highlight some of the other arenas in which I think civic space uh, is claimed by young people in very important ways. I think young people in Africa and elsewhere at the center of leadership of public popular protest and dissent around climate and climate change and the impact which it's having on, there is a, there is a very important gap to be filled in, an, in a more um, scholarly engagement with the triangle of youth conflict and climate that I think is really important in the continent. Um, I think there, is, um, there are amazing initiatives, for example, in Nigeria, the movement around Too Young to Run, which is, which is essentially making the argument if we're not too young to vote, then we're not too young to run for office. And there are a large number of places in which age is a constraint on young people's ability to actually run for office. So this is not just about participation uh, in the political process through the vote and the abdication of, of direct participatory democracy, but young people claiming the need to, to hold office and to run for office. And the restrictions on that, I think is very important. Um, the third issue that I would like to raise is just the inclination when we think about young people's protest and dissent to almost automatically gravitate to those arenas in which the media attention focuses on youth violence. Um, and there's too little emphasis placed and attention given to the innovative ways in which young people peacefully shape the space. A perfect example of this. The Fees Must Fall movement in South Africa was, was got all the attention where this sort of straddled the, the divide and sort of fell over onto the other side of violent action. There were unbelievable parts of that movement, which were innovative young people claiming that space because they had brilliant ideas about alternative ways of financing education in South Africa in, in the post-apartheid era, because they were very articulate about the failure of transitional justice to deliver to a to the born free generation, the next generation of young people uh, in, in wake of the South African process. I think these are amazing places to learn from. And then lastly, just to say, um, uh, in a place like Mauritius, uh, youth activism that is organized around ecological disaster is illustrative of the fact that young people are saying in a small island state, which is part of the African continent, um, uh, if we don't address the climate issues, we aren't getting to some of the core issues that young people as guardians of the future, as the next generation of leaders, are prior, primarily concerned with. And this is a place in which political participation, educational investment, et cetera, et cetera, in young people is very, is very impressive. And yet there's this gap in the failure to address the priority issues for young people around uh, environmental degradation and climate issues that actually may be 
an indication of fragility in a place where we really haven't anticipated it or a, a, a gr growing protest around that. In Yemen, young people um, occupying bombed out buildings with, um, with, with public artwork and, uh, you know, paintings of, of uh, documenting human rights violations, uh, illustrating the, 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 the mental health and trauma implications of war for young people in an ongoing situation of conflict, incredible occupation of civic space that is not formal, uh, but informal. I just wanted to flag these issues because I think they give us a very creative spectrum on how we need to think about these things and think about youth resilience, sometimes as survivalist, sometimes as adaptive, and potentially as transformative, but not necessarily all of those things. A recognition of the, of the fact that sometimes resilience can manifest negatively where there aren't creative spaces occupied, where young people fall across that dividing line, but very often resilience as a positive dimension. We need to think more critically about all of these things is in this conversation. So just a wonderful conversation. I'm so happy to be a part. Thank you. Thank you so much, Graham, for taking us through very interesting ideas you've been part of. You and I have had a series of exchanges over the years, uh, since 2016, I believe. And we, we, you know, we keep engaged on these issues mm -hmm. in relation to, to Africa. You flagged some very important uh, issue in terms of um, between policy announcement and pronouncement on youth issues, policy commitment on youth issues on the one hand, and the reality of what actually happens. A lot of government um actions on youth are mere tokenism in relation to the fact that even decisions about how to include youth what in ways of in ways of including youth are always taken without young people's involvement so that in itself you know is often the start of the problem but the issue of youth inclusion in politics and decision making goes right to the heart of power to the heart of politics to the heart of you know, intergenerational issues, intergenerational tensions uh, uh, in relation to events in Africa. And of course, beyond the world, we are seeing, you know, these many of the questions we thought were only about young people in relation to Africa, we are seeing them even in many developing countries. And in the last two, three weeks, we've seen young people as members of Extinction Rebellion blocking key highways in the UK on a consistent basis. And we've also seen the disruptive uh, use of use, you know, some call it youth as spoilers uh, in, you know, the use of that spoiler power by young people in other countries, in Canada, in America, in Germany, in France, we are seeing it popping up all over. So many of these conversations are not just about young people in developing countries, especially Africa. There are also real politics issues as well in many, you know, in, in, in so-called uh, 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 Western democracies. I will leave that. Thank you, Graham. We know you have to go. Thanks for all our presenters so far who have given us the opening pitch. Uh, we are now going to open this up for um, cross-cutting debate conversations, ideas from not just among our panelists and speakers, but also among uh, all the participants. I know on the program we are meant to go for a break. Uh, do I want to crave every, I don't want us to lose momentum because quite a number of issues have been put on the on the table by our presenters and um, each in that we use that momentum to, to power on. That will mean perhaps we finish maybe 10 minutes early or something, if it is fine with everyone. Uh, Rose Rita, I see that you put your hand up. Um, do you have a response uh, with regard? Uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, yeah. we, may, we may have to ask the uh, interpreters if uh, they still, to use your language, have the energy to power on. <laughs> you know, so, uh, well, this is a conversation about youth. We are a number of us are youth people. <laughs> Well, they, they, are past, they, are past, they are past youth, I can tell you that much, like me, you know. Yeah, so, very so. Could, I, could, could you ask the interpreters if it's fine to Oh, yeah, well, they, 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 he's, insisting, he's insisting on five minutes. Okay. So we do have to shut down for five okay, minutes. Let's shut down, but please, we do not need to log off. We do not need, let's don't, just... Don't log off. Yeah, we just... Uh, as we, said, yeah. we are now going to the very interesting part of this webinar. Please... Yeah. Uh, let's go on five minutes break, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's stay on. That's right. Uh. 
Um, Wale. Yes, Prof, I'm here. Uh, there was a message from Ramata okay. in the chat. Uh, please read it. Okay. Okay. I've seen the message. Yeah. Hi, Ishmael. Hi, who is, who is that? Emmanuel Sowate. Oh, hi, Emmanuel. How are you? Hi, Zakra. Ah, cool, cool. Yeah, fine. I definitely remember you, so you don't need to introduce yourself. Yeah. Okay. And uh, <laughs> uh, good to see you. Good to see you. It's been, it's been quite a while. The, the last time I saw you, you had an Afro hair. Ah, well, that was a long, long, long time ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway. I'm actually in Cambridge, though. Oh, OK. Yeah. Far from, from me. Yeah, not far, yeah, not far. What college were you? Uh, I was at Fitzwilliam. Oh, okay. We share friends together. Oh, which college are you? St. Edmunds, you know, we share friends. Oh, yeah. yeah, I know, on the other side, yeah, I know. We even have to come and activate our access card at your place to use your back door. Ah, okay. Yeah. You control the back door, so if you want to use the back door. Oh, okay, good. Anyway, we, we, uh, you have my email, so let's let's catch up um, out of you know afterwards. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, yeah when I come back. Mm. Uh, Mr. Moderator and everyone. Yes, yes, sir. Um, yeah. Um, a couple of our Francophone colleagues, uh, Babali Sal, uh, would probably also, uh, yeah, so there it is, the Francophones are free to speak in French. Uh, so Babali, yeah, by all means, raise your hand and, uh, you know, some of our other friends, uh, William Wawa and, uh, and so on, would uh, want to also make an input. Uh, along the way, but that, you know, there's, we now have to begin to also focus on solutions, perceived yes, remedies. Yes, I'm aware. So, uh, yeah. You can be sure that uh, much of the conversations now is going to shift towards that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, do you have um, the name of the document that Graham Simpson spoke about, the latest document on your resolution 2535. Um, you mean is a progress study? Prof, have you seen that? No, I haven't. No, no, he said that it, um, you a mean report has just you? been. Yeah, it was referring to the report by the Office of the Special Envoy on you. I've not. I've heard of it, but I've not. I've not read the report. You haven't seen. It? Yeah. Yes, if it's, so do you have it? If not seen it. Oh, okay. That's my question. Yes, do you have it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. No, I don't have it, Prof. I'm also. I sent Graham a private message, but I think he signed off before. Yeah, I'm uh, sure. He, yeah. The well, yeah. He will, uh, yeah. I'm he, sure there he, might be a link. I think I have the link. I can. Search for it and send it to you. Um, uh, so I okay, think. please do, please do. Okay. Yeah. Dramata, you can, if you have it. Yeah, please do. Yeah, let me search it, it and then I can drop it in the no, no, chat you Actually, you can, you can drop it in the chat. chat box. Okay, yeah. let me, okay, let me look for it. Okay. Thank you, okay. thank you, Ramata. Uh, I think, uh, we'll I, think, minutes, right? I, think I think we should, we should start back. The Zoom, uh, yeah. Uh, our interpreters, are they ready for us? Our interpreters, are you ready for us? 
Thank you so much. All right. Yeah, yeah. For doing a wonderful job as ever for, you know, making us facilitating cross language, cross cultural conversation. We always appreciate you. So welcome back from the break. Uh, we've had in the first part of this webinar, for, you know, based on presentations by, by, by the panelists, uh, we've heard from events in Tunisia in terms of uh, what young people want, uh, young people's, uh, you know, perceived limitations of, of their engagement uh, in policy process, sense of unfulfilled expectations, sense of injustice, um, and the lack of responsiveness on the part of state and institutions um, as part of the post revolution realities that many young people complain about. We've also heard from Rosewita in Zimbabwe, where she, she tells us about what young people are doing and what the state is doing to bring young people into mainstream decision making processes to advance inclusive uh, politics that you know, that reflects uh, young people's participation. And she's also spoken to us about the wider dimensions of youth activism in Zimbabwe. That is not just about protests. There are also many other very important things that young people are doing to insert themselves in policy, policy processes and policy spaces. And she also talks about the limitations and the challenges that they face in trying to advance youth inclusion in politics. We've also heard from our colleague, uh, Livermon, uh, who, who has also thrown a light on the, the fact that when we talk about youth issues uh, in Africa, there are some hidden component of it that that youth uh, may not be representative of, uh, of all young people. He, 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 he provides an insight into the situations of young people who are members of the LGBTQ community in South Africa and their own challenges and the extent to which mainstream politics, mainstream policy processes, mainstream government uh, 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 interventions is neg you know, neglects this reality. We've also heard from Graham Simpson, where he talks us through uh, the fact that uh, uh, young people's protests um, beyond the headline grabbing uh, violent dimensions of it. Uh, there are also some important uh, ideas, you know, that come out of those protests and he was uh, pointing to the kinds of messages, the kinds of alternative visions of society, alternative ideas and search for solutions that young people do put out there in the public space when it comes to uh, finding solutions to events in society. We go back to the central theme of this webinar, which is how, you know, how do we address young people's inclusion, young people's activism in the context of shrinking political and civic uh, spaces in Africa and beyond. And my first question to the panelists and to the entire uh, participant today is, what is it that we've observed? when it comes to this, what works? What works and what do not work? What works and works well when it comes to advancing young people's political inclusion? What works in translating youth political activism into youth inclusion, meaningful inclusion in policy processes? What works in moving from protest to actual youth representation? How are you, you know, what has worked in post-revolution in, you know, events in, in Tunisia? What is the experience in post-Mugabe, Zimbabwe? What is the experience in post-Kampaori, Burkina Faso? What is the experience in, a no, you know, in post-Bashil, Sudan? You know, and a number of these places when it comes to advancing youth inclusion in politics. And I think we should start our conversation uh, on that. What is it that we've, we've learned or we are going to learn that works when it comes to advancing this? And what does not work well? Sometimes we need to go back to the opposite to understand what exactly we're interested in. So I'm going to open the floor uh, for contributions and you know, reflections on this. Uh, I want to urge us to make this as 
concise as much as possible so we can have you know a proper conversation across the board uh who wants to go first please indicate if you want to speak can you indicate by raising up your hand I've, i can see rosewita i can see ben Salah, who have already you know already you know raised their hand up other people are also welcome to indicate their interest in speaking rosewita please Um, thank you. Um, interesting uh, conversations uh, ongoing here, and I like uh, the dimension that you are bringing uh, to then say we need to also start um, interrogating uh, what works and, um, you know, because often at times we are so much pressed with identifying the challenges, but it's also equally important to then see how then do we counter some of the challenges that we have, is in light of the shrinking civic space. So I'll just speak briefly from our experience to say um, what we've also seen working in Zimbabwe is then to say um, there's this you know, shrinking civic space, there are these COVID-19 restrictions which limits youth engagement. So it's also about how do we find spaces where young people are, how do we identify the issues that interest young people. So for example, in Zimbabwe, we've noted that um, at times you get more youth engagement if you reach out to them in the informal spaces, if you reach out to young people, be it in their church groups, in their social circles, if you use uh, social media. So it's important that we also identify alternative spaces for youth engagement in cases where we have some restrictions in the so-called formal uh, spaces uh, for engagement. And then secondly, I want, I want to speak to what we are currently doing and what we have seen working is around creative activism to then say, in the face of the challenges, what are the opportunities? What are the available uh, platforms for engagement? So we've been utilizing a lot of uh, young influencers, for example, utilizing arts, entertainment. So you use satire to be able to bring out issues and also engage um, young, young people. And I think moving forward, what we need to do, and um, we need to really continue pushing the government to ensure that they increase their commitment to youth inclusion. We need to really ensure that we have young people taking up leadership positions. And for me, it's also around how then do we also support young people that want to get into political office so that we have more um, youth um, representation so that they can be able to address youth issues. And I think it's also high time that young people are also proactive. So sometimes you don't have to wait for a government or a certain stakeholder to create spaces or platforms for you. It's about how can we have young people who are proactive, young people who are creative and innovative to be able to create spaces to table their issues and also to demand for accountability and address of their issues. So let me stop here so that other um, Thank you. colleagues can also- Thank you, Rita. Um, ben Salah, please. Yeah, I mean, the Tunisian experience is quite a little bit different when it comes to uh, uh, the civic space in general. Uh, and uh, the pandemic actually has been an opportunity to showcase what youth can do because we had a lot of movements and a lot of uh, uh, action on the ground made by youth. Uh, and this, uh, this was a, a, like a promotion to youth uh, uh, activism, responsibility and how they, they can lead uh, uh, projects and, and, and initiatives on the ground. Um, the other question what I'm, I mean, as researchers, we always uh, uh, have this question in mind. What is the difference between a participatory approach and an inclusive approach? And that's, that has been a long uh, 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 discussion. We had long discussions about it. And one of the outputs of, of these discussion is that if we want to have a, a, a more inclusive and participatory civic space. Uh, I think we should work also on the elders and not just the youth. And this is also uh, to, to prove that we're always looking at youth as targeted population and not just a part of 
a whole conversation. So if if we work on on uh, educating also the other generations on how youth are responsible, how they can do things, how they they are efficient, effective, more modern, more uh, informed, uh, that would help also the whole society to, to accept uh, uh, youth willingness to change and youth uh, uh, civic engagement. I, I, th I think that's, that's a very uh, uh, important part of the equation uh, on itself, is working on both sides. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think somebody, Jabatan, or who else, you know, I think has indicated interest in speaking from ISS. Someone from called Jabatan. Uh, but the floor is open. The floor is open now. This is not just a conversation between our panelists. I'm keen for participants to also bring their own perspective on to, uh, you know, to enrich our, our understanding of these issues. What capacities, for example, are required on the part of young people, what do they? What capacity do they need in order to actually not just identify the spaces that Rose has talked about, but actually take advantage of those spaces? It's quite interesting that yes, more opportunities need to be created, but even in certain contexts in certain countries, there are opportunities that are there that are not being fully exploited by young people, either because of survivalist challenges that have been mentioned. They need to look for work, they need to feed, they need to, to survive. And as such, uh, issue of meaningful engagement and participation in decision making becomes secondary to young people. So it's also important for us to reflect what kinds of capacities, what kind of organizational platforms are young people, uh, you know, are required on the part of young people for them to be able to take advantage of, ex of spaces that either already exist or for them to create new spaces. One of the things that is also very uh, crucial when it comes to understanding youth activism and inclusion, uh, and we've seen experiences of this from Tunisia to Egypt to Burkina Faso and the rest is, young people are organized enough for protests, but they are not organized enough for power. They are not organized enough to actually translate their protest you know, our potentials into uh, claiming of political power and, you know, uh, uh, capturing political power and capturing the state. But in any case, I want to open this up. I invite uh, interest and uh, contributions from members of the floor uh, who seeks to, you know, who would like to speak to or contribute to this debate. Who would like to contribute to this debate? Um, can, I, can I speak? Please go ahead, please. Yes. Um. Thank you. Thank you for the for the for, for the insightful conversations. Um. Well, I'm going to add some stuff that Rosita spoke about in Zimbabwe, and it's a conversation that we always joke around. Um. You know, around youth 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 inclusion, and and I've I've always said to Rosita, you know, I, I disagree with the model uh, that government approaches. I mean that that the the civil society has taken, uh, one of which is um to to to, to campaign for for youth quotas. I disagree. Um, I, I think I, I think on many grounds, but I think I, I think the challenge here um, is to take a radical approach because I don't I don't think we've more we've mobilized the the, the, the the youth and civil society sufficient enough to 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 do exactly what you what you're talking about to assume power because I think the youth need to learn from what works what what is the advantage what sort of power do they have um, they, they can possibly use. To, to, to narrow the gap and 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 also and also and also enter into spaces of decision making and, and and so forth and and for me I think it's about time that the youth you know, take the space by force I mean it's not it's not it's not it's not it's not advocating violent violent approaches to 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 to, to, to demand attention but the only language that perhaps the the, the state would understand it's for youth to, to spoil the party. And that's how they can possibly react. It's reactionary, yes, but it's all, it also then narrows, it also uh, then increases the aspect. Well done uh, for, the, for the presentation. Yeah. Um, I... uh, 
Uh, Lloyds, please continue. Um, yes. So, so I, was I, saying, I was saying, you, can I challenge you? Where yes. uh, has this idea of youth taking the space by force, you've seen it work? Where has it been implemented? Because now we, we want I, to, I, I, I to, to, you know, this. No, I, 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 there are, there are idealistic dimensions of this, but let's speak to the realities that we can see, we can feel. Where or how do you think this has yes. worked? Can you point yes. to specific I, examples? Exactly. So I thought I thought maybe we would learn from the Tunisian experience. I think if we if we learn, I think if if, if we expound on the Tunisian experience, it was a moment that you, that would would envy in Africa. In, 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 I, I think anywhere across that the youth took action and it addresses some of the fundamental questions of the day at that particular time. So I think learning from that experience, I think we can expand and see how things possibly work. If youth come and say, no, we actually want to, we are demanding this specific space, they can close that space and, and get it. And they can get it by by by, by, by pointing the party for, 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 for the current system. Because you know, in Africa, no one is willing to seize power. And the youth have been used. Thank you. And, 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 and it, yeah. Thank you. Essentially, uh, that's, that, that's the argument. Thank you. Interesting that Ben Salah is here. I'm sure he will have a response to that, uh, but I can yeah. already guess his response. But before then, I also am aware that Mahamadou Abderrahman, Abderrahmani, is also indicated his interest. Mahamadou Abderrahmani, please. Mahamadou Abderrahmani, please. Can young people seize the space? Can they take over the space? Can there be actually a complete transformation of the culture and nature of Hello? Africa. Hello, Mamadou Abderrahmani, please go ahead. Oui. OK, eh, bonjour. Uh, donc, moi, c'est Mamadou Abderrahmani, le représentant SSN uh, au, au Niger. Alors, uh, je, je félicite les panélistes qui nous ont donné uh, uh, les expériences de la Tunisie, de Zimbabwe. Mais ma question et que comment euh, ces panélistes-là perçoivent, euh, euh, on va dire, le conflit régérationnel entre les jeunes et les vieux dans la réduction des, des prises, euh, euh, on va dire, euh, de la réduction des prises de parole et des prises de décision en Afrique. Je vous remercie. Um, I think we might have been having issues with this with this connection, but I think he, again it was perhaps hinting at the possibility of the shrinking space as part of that intergenerational contest for power in Africa that has is a long history since the post independence uh, decade, in which those leaders at independence have systematically erected barriers that have shut out. Uh, other young people from challenging them uh, for political power uh, since independence. Um, can I go back to, I think somebody from Mano River Union is also raising up their hand. Ben Bell. Ben, yeah, please. my name is, hello. Yes, please go ahead, Mano River Union, please. My name is Peter Kukui, actually. I, okay. I, sit, I sit in Monrovia. I am the coordinator of the Amanda River Union Civil Society Natural Resource Governance Platform. I take interest in um, this very important discussion from the angle that you should seize, you know, the space, you should uh, set sort of seize power. I don't know how, uh, because what I've noticed in, in now part of the world is quite often the situation with youth and adults is like the rebel fighters and the political leadership of rebel movements. The rebels are in the bush fighting when they get to town, the political leadership want to take the power. So young people are engaged in politics, but they are the one used to do the dead work. They are engaged in protest. Even those that are somewhat given the space to serve on the leadership of the country, there is an argument that they are inexperienced and that they're not ready you know, to run the country. They're not ready for state power. So there is a sense that young people need you know, some reorientation. They need to sit down and think about what 
you know, they are adults see them to be. You know, long ago we had this fight for women's rights. I think it's about how it's hard time we begin to think more about you know youth rights, uh, so that we're not just using young people to join in the streets and protest, but that we want to use them in a more meaningful way for development purposes, and that they should be even in the position to prepare themselves for that kind of leadership position. Otherwise, I think um, politicians who are very greedy are continuously going to use young people to achieve their political ends. And at the end of the day, they are dumping them. There are no opportunities for them to even aspire uh, to do anything better. So it is a very serious challenge uh, that I think we need to explore a little more. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very brief uh... Uh, I know I, I can see uh, Lina Osman and Fred Lin. I'll come back to you in a minute. Uh, ben Salah, I want you to, in one minute, respond to uh, the question posed in relation to events in Tunisia. In one minute, please. Yeah. Um, very fast. I mean, I understand Lloyd's point of view um, and, and comparing the Tunisian experience to what he's uh, been saying, but the Tunisian experience is uh, different. It, it wasn't violent. Uh, the idea was, or, or what made it happen and the change at some point in 2011 happened, it's only because the perseverance of youth and the patience of youth. It took months of demonstrations to have such a change. And uh, youth, uh, uh, we're lucky to have uh, an informant uh, group of youth that uh, uh, really had a strong belief in possible change. It wasn't violent. It wasn't like we took the street, uh, yes, by demonstrating on the street, but we were faced by violence and not producing violence or we weren't, yeah. I mean, violence is a, yeah, it's a red line. Uh, I, I, just just another point about the po politics and how, how to get youth uh, involved in politics. There is a, a huge disruption, discrepancy between civil society and politics or civic engagement and politics. Youth are resenting politics in general because at, like until now, politicians didn't give time to civil society or youth to actually have a vision or demonstrate on visionary uh, uh, issues. We have almost every month a, a demonstration, a youth demonstration, but all these demonstrations are to uh, or against a specific issue and not visionary. Like for example, the, the, latest, uh, 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 the latest demonstrations uh, that changed uh, politics in Tunisia didn't have a vision. We people just went to the street to say we don't want more of these politicians and not proposing another alternative for that. So that's why we're in a, a bit of a tricky situation right now because those who demonstrate and youth weren't informed enough to propose a vision to the country. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a follow-on question, not necessarily for you, but it's also something to reflect for, for the conversation, you know, today, which mm -hmm. is, can you do it alone? Can young people, can youth groups, youth social movement, can they do it alone? Or what is required for the kinds of transformation that will actually serve youth meaningful inclusion in politics is a broad-based coalition that transcend youth groups to also involve other elements of civil society. How, you know, this is something we also want to pick up on, but let me invite Lina Osman, followed by Fred Lin, to make their contribution. Lina, please. Thank you so much. First of all, I, I want to thank you all for providing me with such a wonderful opportunity to contribute to such an engaging and necessary conversation. Um, I want to say that I am currently a program officer at the Geneva Institute for Human Rights. So I'm very much involved in the development of human rights projects and the advocacy for human rights issues, particularly the youth. Um, with that being said, um, what I've noticed as of recent, particularly with the COVID-19 pandemic and all the issues that have been exacerbated by that, 
Um, the rights of the youth and their needs have been to a certain extent recognized. However, the issue lies with the enforcement of these rights or the integration of these rights within policy and legal frameworks or perhaps even national action plans and agendas. And as previously said, the issue right now is furthermore the villainization of youth and their initiatives. So I would, for in, on, on my end, I would say that the way that they could further seize the space or have more of a voice for effective participation is through collaborative action with uh, key national um, key national uh, actors. And I've seen this work through the through uh, the fostering of the development of participatory structures within national institutions. I've seen this work, for instance, in Bangladesh, where they created a national youth parliament in which the youth were given the opportunity to contribute to national policy as they had direct dialogue with parliamentarians and uh, government officials. So um, I just wanted to add to everything that was said, and I wanted to give my opinion on what the youth could do to further enhance their capacity for engagement within uh, democratic processes and, and practices. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for emphasizing um, practical ways in which the contributions and participations of young people in policy processes can work in real life. Can I call on Fredlin, please? Hi, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'm um, Fredlin McCormack, Halo Research with ASSN, among other things, and also want to add my thanks to the panel and to participants for the discussion. I just wanted to echo one um, with the respondent or the participant from Liberia mentioned, which has been the politicization of the youth uh, in Sierra Leone. I'm going to speak on Sierra Leone and uh, where I'm from. The youth are used by politicians to, as thugs. Um, they're used to support whichever political party. And there's this idea that youth are paid and, and that you, th there's not much worth accorded to them outside of this role as, uh, uh, you know, as, as thugs to break up to break up party rallies or to intimidate opponents, things like that. And so along with this, you have, as was just mentioned um, by Lina Usman, you have the villainization of the youth also. Um, so what's happened in Sierra Leone, there were a series of interventions where um, there was a, a citizens manifesto that was developed and youth voices you know, mentioned that one of the things they wanted was to have a quota. But one of the limitations that we see with approaches for the youth is this homogenization of, of youth. So often the interventions are targeted at males. You don't have much discussion about women or, or, or female youth. You don't have much reaching out to them. There's this idea that it's the men, it's the, it's the, 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 the male youth that are involved in violence. So we, see, we have to see how to appease them without thinking about how do you also bring in female voices? How do you bring in their perspectives? How do you bring them to the table also? Um, so there are some civil society organizations that are working, uh, such as 5050, that are working with um, females within communities to be, um, you know, to identify problems, to be able to, to be problem solvers, um, peacemakers, things like that. But these aren't integrated into national policies. And so the, the intervention I just wanted to make was to say that we need to think more critically when we talk about youth and that we need to make sure that we're not just focusing. I think we've lost uh, Fred Lin, maybe our internet um, um, uh, caught or something. Uh, but thank oh, you. I was done. Oh, okay. I was done. Oh, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. I think the key issue you are emphasizing is when we talk about youth, we should make that composition of youth we talk about to be as inclusive as possible. So we are not talking about male youth, or we are not talking about young people that are privileged faces in civil society movement who are well known, that we should also make our ideas of youth inclusion to be representative of that cohort called youth, in which case we have to take care of the internal differentiation and different categories of youth and to make sure youth related agenda reflects uh, the cross cutting needs of uh, different categories of youth. Um, I also want to flag one or two issues based on my own research and knowledge of the terrain in terms of what is it that works in advancing and expanding uh, spaces for youth part meaningful participation in, in politics. 
One of it is also the capacity of youth groups to seize current opportunities for, for change. Uh, virtually all countries do have ways for engaging with legislatures for you know promoting new laws and regulations that can expand the space the civic space for young people that can um, of course at least in theory but also that can help to address the barriers to young people's meaningful involvement in decision making processes and we have example from nigeria the not too young to run uh, initiative is one example where youth groups identified a problem, they developed evidence-based advocacy around it, they lobbied you know, the legislature, they undertook massive social media campaign that garnered not just local but also international support, and they made it a key issue for national debate, a key issue for uh, the political parties to express their commitment to it. And through that, a new law was passed that, if not completely removing, but reduced the barriers, the age-based barriers to youth participation in politics in, in Nigeria. That is one important example for understanding mechanisms that can advance youth inclusion. We also, we've also seen instances whereby mass protests mass action can force the expansion of the civic space for youth activism. We've seen instances of that in, in South Africa. We've seen instances of it in Nigeria with the NSAS protest. We've seen ongoing situations in Ghana, the fixed Ghana, you know, protest and, you know, and quite a, you know, of similar events in a number of countries where issue-based uh, protest, issue-based activism, uh, apart from addressing the specificities of those issues, also translated into expanding the space, giving young people a voice, and announcing the arrival of young people into the political scene. Um, but beyond that, I also want us to spend the next 10 minutes to talk about what is it that can be done in terms of re recommendations for expanding uh, the civic space for young people. How can young people be supported to increase their presence in the civic space? How can young people be supported to advocate for expansion of the civic space? How can young people and youth groups, you know, how can they be supported? What kind of recommendations will work in advancing uh, their, uh, uh, you know, their, you know, their participation in in meaningful decision-making processes. So uh, this is in relation to uh, what organizations like the IDRC, you know, other institutions across the world, and mm. the UN, the AU, and regional bodies, what exactly can be done? Uh, beyond, and when we are talking about what is that can be done, we are not just talking about those normal policy pronouncements, you know, that at the end of the day, they mean nothing in real life. We want to reflect on practical ideas, practical solutions uh, that can be the inclusion of uh, young people and the expansion of the civic space. Can I return back to Roswitha, please? Roswitha, can you give us your reflections on this, please? Roswitha, please. Uh, thank you. Um, can you confirm if you can hear me? We can hear you. All right, thank you. Um, and so, a uh, very interesting discussion um, ongoing, but I maybe first of all, I wanted to just uh, maybe quickly comment, maybe pose a question to the contribution that was made by Lloyd, where he uh, spoke around the recommendation for, I mean, on the need of young people to, you know, be radical, to spoil the part like what happened in Tunisia. And for me, I've been reflecting then to say, in light of the context that we have in Zimbabwe, where there is um, a lot of, there is increased authoritarianism, and if there is any planned demonstration, uh, the army is in use to maybe beat up people. We have seen human rights 
rights activists, uh, you know, even some opposition activists are being arrested. And I think that kind of an environment, the militarization of the environment has also created a lot of fear among young people such that it's even difficult to even mobilize them to maybe come together, push for something because there's this fear, maybe they're gonna be arrested. And because we've also seen these human rights violations that have happened in the past and no one has been accountable. So for me, it's just <laughs> it's something that I'm posing to them say, how do we uh, manage the situation in that context where there's a lot of fear, where the government can um, is militarized and can be able to just pounce on anyone who thinks they can organize, mobilize, and push for, 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 for something. Um, then my second um, contribution is, um, I think there was uh, an issue that was raised earlier on, and I think... Um, it's important that um, when we would then want to look at recommendations in terms of how then do we address these challenges, how do we ensure that we have meaningful and active youth engagement, we need to then ensure that it's not a something that you, young people can do amongst themselves, but they also need to work with different stakeholders. And I think we need to use that holistic approach where um, there's a lot of stakeholder engagement. We look at other partners that are also critical on these issues to then see how, what role they could also play to have, then ensure that we have active involvement of young people. For me, I'm looking at the private sector, civil society, government departments. How do we also even look at other structures, mm. even at community level, even at family level, because I think this also have a bearing in terms of addressing some of the current challenges uh, that young people are, are facing. And I think as yet, what we've also been doing is a lot of intergenerational dialogue, where at times it's also critical to create that platform where young people can then be able to engage the, uh, the other generations. But I think what we've also seen is that often in terms when you also have this interge intergenerational dialogues engagement you also need to ensure that you are able to fa facilitate them well because sometimes it ends up being a like a confrontational approach because on one end the older generation they, they want to be in power and then young people are saying it's time for us to get into power but at the end of the day what i think is a way forward is then to then see how we can get more and more young people into uh this um leadership uh, position and then my uh, my last comment is then to say uh looking at our context in zimbabwe i think we need to then see how we can also work more around enhancing youth capacities around their political consciousness because of the current economic, political, economics, um, social crisis we have in the country. We have a lot of young people that are somehow engaged in terms of how they can be able to um, make the linkages between you know, their current challenges, for example, why they can't afford a decent life, why livelihood, why they can't even afford to pay fees um, at a tertiary institution or at an university, why they can't even afford um, uh, decent accommodation or access to health and how that is linked to the issue of politics and power at the end of the day. So I think we need then to ensure that there's that political consciousness where young people can then make those um, connections and uh, see, because for them, once they see that... Um, uh, there's need for them, there's need to address the current challenges. They can be able to actively participate, they have interest in participating in political processes, having interest in them taking up leadership positions. Because at the end of the day, what we are also having more of in Zimbabwe is that most of the young people, they don't even trust the government institutions, even the electoral processes. They then say, oh, what is the need for me? If I'm going to vote, if I'm going to, you know, vote in an election, the results will be manipulated. So I think we need to work more around, you know, that issue of political consciousness and also even emphasizing the, 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 the power of numbers so that we can be able to influence the change that we want to see. Thank you. Thank you, Ros Rosmita. Uh, ben Salah, please. And then Livermore. We'll come to Livermore in a minute. Ben Salah, please. Yeah, back to the to the question of political or uh, political engagement and on how the processes can be more inclusive to to 
uh, inclusive for youth, uh, I think uh, that's that that should take a lot of time. So we need to to be patient, not not be passive, but uh, uh, we need to be patient. Youth need to have that patience in them and and believe that they can. Uh, 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 integrate. From the other hand, institutions, at least in the experience of Tunisia, as as most most other countries and experiences we've been uh, discussing today, uh, uh, legislation exists uh, that protects civic space and and uh, 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 protect youth uh, in general. But how to make sure that these legislations are uh, 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 implemented on the ground? The other, the other uh, maybe challenge uh, that we face is that uh, the world uh, is changing fast, and youth are raised to be fast learners and fast uh, uh, and looking for fast change. And that's uh, one thing that all of us, uh, from civil society, political sphere, or governments in general, we need to understand that we need to act fast. Uh, to, to fulfill or to achieve expectations uh, or, or youth expectations. Again, another, yeah, just, just one other thing. We need also to understand that we need to think about youth feeling of inclusion and not just trying to be inclusive. For example, uh, uh, if we're building cities with, with very good roads, uh, opportunities, employment, and uh, like everything is 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 great. Uh, we still have young people who don't feel included, and this is very important in work to work on inclusion. That feeling of inclusion and feeling of social justice is so important. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> can I call on Libamo, please? Yes, um, thank you. I'll just say a couple of things. One, um, I, I do think that we shouldn't underestimate protests as a form of politics. Um, and as, as a form of politics that sometimes gets things done that actually can't or forces the hand of our more traditional forms of politics, um, that there sometimes is power in, in standing outside of official channels in official forms of civil society or formal politics. Um, I think the one thing that I'll just say is the lesson that I'll take from my work and my research is the necessity of bottom-up approaches, um, the necessity of actually listening to um, young people, and I'd echo something that you know, other presenters have said, but I'm thinking um, here about Fridline and um, also Rosawita, just about getting more women's voices involved. Like, so just listening, I think, um, to uh, the diverse voices of, of young people. And I think really taking seriously the, the solutions that people in many cases have come up with or thought about for themselves. I think there's a lot of top down or imposition of ideas that um, are developed at a higher up level and then imposed onto people. Um, this includes the youth. Um, and I just think uh, if, if we can really kind of move from that other approach, I think that we can we can think about that as a way to, to actually empower the youth and get them involved in um, politics. And um, I think that's that's the last thing that I'll say. Thank you. Um, can wow. I take one more intervention from once? If anyone has any bunny. Mr. Moderator, Wale. Yes, Prof. Uh, either uh, uh, a couple of our Francophone colleagues, Babali Sao uh, or uh, Khalidu Sai, or a colleague from uh, Tanzania, uh, William uh, Wawa who's had some uh, interesting local level ideas about youth. Yes, I invite them to, you know, to offer their reflection yeah. on, on this issue, but we have to do it quickly because we have yeah. been just yeah. about three yeah. minutes. If you can do it in one minute, uh, we're happy to take uh, their yeah. contribution. Kalidu, can you do it? Kalidu? Is Kalidu still there? 
Oui, okay. je suis ici. Yeah. One minute, entendez? Kalidou. One minute, Kalidou. Can you make your contribution in a minute, please? Sorry, we are out of time. Can you make it in a Merci minute, beaucoup. please? Donc, euh, j'ai pu euh, faire euh, ce qu'on appelle un résumé de plusieurs recherches qui s'intéressaient sur euh, la violence euh, chez les jeunes, que ce soit dans des pays d'Afrique de l'Ouest, au Sénégal, au Niger, en Afrique de l'Ouest, au Zimbabwe ou en Afrique du Sud. Euh, en Afrique du Sud. Et euh, ce qu'on peut dire, c'est que euh, l'origine et les facteurs qui favorisent ces violences sont différentes selon euh, la région, mais euh, selon, on peut dire aussi, euh, l'historique des pays. Par, par exemple, il y a des pays où, euh, je pourrais dire, euh, dans certains pays, comme l'Afrique du Sud, on va prendre l'exemple de l'Afrique du Sud, euh, la marginalisation euh, de, leur, de, de certaines communautés, ou un mot que j'aime pas trop, race, en Afrique du Sud, où la discrimination raciale ou racisme d'État est ancrée historiquement avec l'apartheid, euh, on peut dire que les communautés noires de couleur elles continuent d'être exclues de la communauté dominante. Et cette exclusion a créé et maintenu des problèmes structurels qui ont produit à leur tour un produit un environnement propice où les armes à feu ont une valeur symbolique en tant que signe et produit de statut ainsi qu'une source de substance dans, dans la pauvreté. Cette violence, en fait, c'est conséquence d'une injustice et d'un racisme d'État institutionnalisé. Il y a une étude, qui, étude de, de, euh, une étude de Boutelézi en 2012 qui a montré que, qui estime qu'il y a 137 gangs et plus de 100 000 membres de gangs dans la seule péninsule du Cap. Après, il y a aussi d'autres formes de violence, comme euh, par exemple. Kalindo, we have to, we have to, we have to, to, to stop because we, we are out of time. Our interpreters are going to stop interpreting. Ah, je suis désolé. Shortly. I'm sorry. Je peux, vous faire, je peux vous faire une petite conclusion vite fait, peut-être, si vous voulez. For the point you made. Okay, if you say it in just 10 seconds, please. <laughs> Donc, en gros, ce que les recherches ont montré, c'est que pour plus d'efficacité, il faut que plusieurs acteurs collaborent et ça, ça doit se faire à plusieurs niveaux entre les politiques, la société civile et l'État en tel qu'une qu institution. Donc voilà, ça c'est un peu un résumé de ce que je peux dire. Je suis désolé parce qu'on n'a pas beaucoup de temps, je ne voulais pas trop. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Let me just, uh, I would like to have the final word and I'll pass this to Ramata and Prof in a minute. I also want to, uh, you know, add a final word that from my own research and ongoing engagement on this topic, I also know that what we see as the high level, national level uh, contestation for expanding the civic space is, you know, has to be founded on something bigger than it which is the importance of a bottom-up approach. Many African countries since independence, the uh, brick and mortar of youth involvement in national level political civic space has been broken down, has been taken away systematically. And we need to rebuild that. We need to go back to the era of student union politics. We need to restore young people's participation in community associations. We need to restore young people's involvement mm -hmm. in civic effort at the local level and build coalitions. And it is those coalitions that have tended to manifest as national level mobilization in which no categories of young people are left behind. And that produces a truly broad-based national level youth groups that are in constant dialogue with state bodies, state institutions to not just expand the civic space, but also to advance higher level goals in terms of youth socioeconomic empowerment, in terms of education, in terms of livelihood. So we should not just think of the national level mobilization. Where civic space, the strategies that have worked, you will see in the not too young to run initiative in Nigeria that you had a lot of coalition building um, from local level to state level and across region and, you know, and making it an international campaign as well. This is also an important recommendation for advancing youth campaign when it comes to uh, 
you know, youth inclu inclusion in politics. Let, I, I will leave it at that. Thank you, everyone, for your wonderful time, for uh, sharing your thoughts and ideas with us today. I'm going to return this back to Prof and Ramata to have the, you know, the closing word. Prof and Ramata, please. Yes, uh, Ramata, can you... Um give the vote of thanks and uh, I will then uh, close off with uh, not so oui, much a comment uh, as merci. an encouragement to you. Okay. Oui, c'est vraiment uh, remercier tout le monde pour leur contribution. Je pense que c'est une uh, thématique d'actualité qui continue une thématique une, une thématique d'actualité um, pour, uh, pour nous tous et, et surtout pour uh, uh, ce continent. Euh, nous, nous, avons, nous pensons qu'avec euh, ce qui a été dit aujourd'hui, euh, beaucoup a été fait, bien sûr, mais beaucoup de défis demeurent, euh, dont euh, la participation euh, effective des jeunes dans la, les prises de décision, euh, avec euh, des politiques publiques qui puissent vraiment mettre l'accent sur la qualité de l'éducation, entre autres. Donc, plusieurs solutions ont été euh, proposées. Euh, même si les, les défis demeurent. Donc, c'est important qu'on maintienne ce momentum et certainement euh, des, des, euh, des recherches ou des études beaucoup plus approfondies euh, devraient pouvoir nous aider à trouver des solutions qui fonctionnent. Euh, donc, sur ce, je voulais vraiment remercier euh, ASSN, remercier mon frère Ismaël euh, et tous les panélistes euh, pour leur générosité et vraiment pour euh, la pertinence de leur propos. Et, et certainement, nous allons, euh, avec euh, l'ASSN, euh, euh, faire une synthèse des de, de discussions euh, qui certainement seront vraiment très utiles euh, pour à un panel de, divers d'acteurs, euh, dont les politiques, la société civile, les jeunes eux-mêmes. Euh, je pense que c'est extrêmement important que ces messages euh, soient amplifiés et, et mis à la disposition d'un public assez vaste pour susciter des changements et un uh, positif uh, à l'échelle. Donc, merci beaucoup uh, tout le monde. Uh, C'était un plaisir d'être là et uh, certainement la réflexion continue. Merci, prof. Well, thank you everybody for participating. This has been a, a really wonderful Unfortunately, I can only say a beginning, and I have no doubt that Wally thinks that uh, this uh, particular context or forum could have been milled uh, much more extensively than we, we've done. And uh, I'm looking forward to a situation where we'd be able to have uh, another occasion to uh, revisit some of these issues. But I'm sorry, my video keeps going off. But let me, let me also uh, suggest uh, to those of you who want to continue this conversation in another forthcoming forum, which is a knowledge platform for security and rule of law uh, annual conference on October the 14th, where we have a session on youth collaboratively with the uh, Institute for Development Studies of the University of Sussex. Uh, where a lot of these same questions about youth and power and inclusivity and so on, uh, but also involving rural youth. There has been a, an implicit tendency to look to urban youth and you know, uh, educated youth and so on. They've done a, an incredible amount of work on uh, rural youth and uh, we'll be introducing them, I think, into the, the larger conversation. So those of you who are interested, uh, by all means, sign up for that, um, for that uh, uh, conference. Uh, if you don't or cannot find the link, uh, please get in touch with the ASSN and we will shepherd you through the various steps. Thank you very much. And uh, particularly to the moderator who <laughs> just totally fascinating. I mean, almost just, uh, I have difficulty grasping the, uh, the scope of uh, this guy's thinking about youth. And of course, uh, Graham Simpson, uh, you know, and uh, these are really two privileged uh, partners to have uh, in any forum uh, of this kind. Uh, thank you very much to the, uh, to the speakers, uh, certainly uh, uh, Ben from uh, 
Tunisia and uh, the uh, 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 one of our favorite people, absolutely, uh, from uh, from uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Roswita. And Roswita's organization is the only professional youth organization uh, that's been involved in this research. So when she talks, she knows how it is to engage, you know, not just from the grassroots, but from the trenches. Okay, and uh, of course, Lloyd and uh, everybody else. So uh, thank you very much and uh, let's stay in touch. Interpreters, thank you very much as well, Ben and Co. Ebenezer and Co. Okay, all right.